Earlier in this lesson, we touched on the significant influence of lake ice cover on both the natural and human environment. The effects of lake ice on weather and climate, along with its sensitivity to climate change, drive our efforts to develop the application of radar remote sensing to monitor lake ice extent from day to day, season to season, or year to year. The annual lake ice cycle encompasses two key events, namely freeze up in fall and break up in spring. Here we will see how compact polarimetric images, such as available from Canada's Radarsat Constellation mission, may support the tracking of lake ice breakup processes. Actually, the applied images were simulated from Radarsat 2 products and predate the launch of RCM. So, let's see what we can find out about the breakup of lakes in the experimental lakes area in the spring of 2016. Within the confines of the yellow box, this map shows the breakup situation on the 29th of March. As you can see in the legend, ice cover is displayed in grey and water in blue. Since spring has only just arrived, it is not surprising that the ice cover of each lake appears to be largely intact. But I figure this map looks different than you expected because it does not have the earmarks of a radar image. So, let me take a few steps back and explain how we made this map. You should keep in mind that the maps involved in the upcoming river ice and ice road case studies were created in a similar manner. So, how did we get from here to here? To begin with, we overlaid the summertime Landsat images that Google Earth uses with a Landsat image acquired during spring. Next, we took a simulated RCM compact polarimetric image, such as the one shown here. This particular image displays the RH, RR and RV polarized backscatter in red, green and blue. To be clear, R refers to the right circular polarization and of course H and V denote the more conventional horizontal and vertical polarizations. We then use topographic vector data to identify the lakes of interest and subsequently crop the radar image to their extent. Using several backscatter intensities and polarimetric variables, we then classified all pixels corresponding to lakes as either ice or water. We chose to display the ice class in grey and the water class in blue. Finally, we masked out all land pixels and added a legend as well as a date. And so, if I mark the area of interest with this border and hide the shorelines, then we have recreated the map that I showed you at the start of our visit to the experimental lakes area. As I mentioned earlier, this map shows that on March 29, the ice cover on all lakes were mostly intact. For two of the lakes, we can actually verify this by means of photographs taken at the time of the Radarsat 2 overpass. They show that both lakes were indeed ice covered and that the air temperature was in fact below freezing. The next available map corresponds to the 15th of April. The notable increase in the extent of water on above all the smaller lakes is a clear sign that the breakup process has started. According to this map, Lake 2, which is relatively large, is mostly covered by ice, whereas the smaller Lake 1 includes a sizable area of water. So let's see if the time-lapse photographs agree with this mapping result. The picture of Lake 2 definitely shows ice cover. And yes, there is clear evidence on, of water on Lake 1. But if you look more closely, you can see that this water actually sits on top of ice cover. So here we have a situation where our map indicates that this lake has ice-free areas 
whereas in reality these areas are comprised of ice cover that is overlain by meltwater ponds. Clearly we have hit on a limitation of radar remote sensing for the monitoring of lake ice breakup. Radar waves do not penetrate water of any depth and therefore do not detect anything that may lay underneath. However, the good news is that the ongoing melt of snow and ice causes the ice cover to become porous. This allows meltwater to drain away and thus simplifies the interpretation of maps as the breakup progresses. The map corresponding to the 22nd of April, which is exactly one week later, demonstrates this point. Lake 1 no longer classifies as water, but is completely covered by ice. The corresponding photograph can be seen to agree. By zooming out, we can see that the ice covers of many other smaller lakes are also free of meltwater. This indicates that they have reached the same bare ice cover condition. Without going into details, I believe that we have evidence to conclude that the snow on larger lakes melted earlier than the snow on smaller lakes. I encourage you to have another look at the maps and photographs that we have seen thus far to verify my conclusion. This photograph for Lake 2 certainly indicates that by April 22nd its snow cover was gone. The map for the 29th of April looks very different. Nearly all smaller lakes appear to have developed into open water, whereas the larger lakes remain mostly ice covered. The photographs validate the conditions of Lake 1 and Lake 2, and thus indicate that the map is generally accurate. Moving on to our last map, which corresponds to the 2nd of May, we can see that the breakup process is practically complete. No more than a small area of ice cover remains. Once again, the available photographs agree. By using radar images to track the breakup of lakes in the experimental lakes area in 2016, we have learned that the process lasted roughly one month had completed by the 2nd of May and was affected by lake size. These findings clearly demonstrate the utility of radar remote sensing in support of the monitoring of lake ice breakup. We also uncovered one of its limitations, namely its failure to distinguish between meltwater and open water. However, the impact of this imperfection was shown to be relatively short-lived and could be mitigated through comparison of mapping results for successive dates. In other words, continuous monitoring is the key to the, the success of this application. In the next case study, we will explore the application of radar images in support of the monitoring of the breakup of river ice. River ice properties and processes differ from lake ice properties and processes because river water flows and lake water is stagnant. Consequently, methods developed to characterize lake ice or river ice by means of radar remote sensing data are not always interchangeable.